Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's wonderful to see so many folks popping into this participant box. Welcome to our FCAN September Hot Topics webinar, Summer FAFSA Strategies, Closing the Gap for the Class of 2024. I'm Kimberly Krupa with FCAN. I'm so thrilled to see so many of you joining us today. This is awesome. Um, so just to kick us off, uh, as we all know, who have lived FAFSA this past year, this summer has been unlike any other in the world of FAFSA completion. Despite the challenges we faced with a delayed and problematic FAFSA rollout, Florida's college access community rose to the occasion in remarkable ways. So as you can see from today's agenda, we're here to celebrate the innovative strategies, the perseverance, a really common word from our summer community, and the significant strides many of us made in closing the FAFSA completion gap for the class of 2024. And today we'll be hearing directly from these frontline leaders uh, that you see here in this, bullet, this bulleted list, uh, people who spearheaded summer FAFSA campaigns across our state. And I think what makes this webinar really special, and thank you all for joining us, um, but it's really the diversity of approaches that we'll be showcasing. Uh, we had multilingual outreach. We had virtual, in-person, nights, weekends, mornings, uh, choose your own adventure, and AI chatbots, um, really pulling out all the stops. Community partnerships, our presenters have really reimagined what it means to complete the FAFSA for a new era. And as we'll see, when we look at the data, these efforts have not only helped the class of 2024, but laid the groundwork for FAFSA 2025 and beyond. Um, and I think that we're all gonna come away seeing what's possible when we talk about FAFSA campaigns for the future. Um, so in the next hour, we'll dive into some key statistics and trends. We'll hear from seven organizations about their most effective strategies and challenges. And we're, we're hopefully gonna have some time for a brief panel discussion and some Q and A to explore really the broader implications of this work beyond the summer of 2024. So our goal today is twofold. We want to celebrate the success of this summer's efforts, and we also want to inspire new approaches that everyone can implement in their own communities to support students on their journey to higher education. So before I turn it over to um, my colleague, Dane, to dive into the data, I just want to briefly highlight the Florida College Access Network and our role in this space. We, uh, we lead the collaborative movement to ensure every Floridian achieves an education beyond high school and a rewarding career. And we do that by partnering with communities and leaders to pave the path to prosperity for Florida families and for our state. Our work spans all these different buckets, but for the sake of time, I highlighted um, collaboration because that is really our DNA, and that is the focus of today's conversation as well. Likewise, central to our approach is the belief in community collaboration. When partners work together toward a shared vision, we remove barriers, we build a robust workforce, and we improve the quality of life for our very distinct regions. And this summer's FAFSA efforts really exemplify this collaborative spirit, bringing together really diverse stakeholders to support Florida students. So as we go, please put your questions in the chat. Feel free to use that uh, webinar Q&A feature and our panelists are already teed up to collaborate and answer questions as they come in. You can ask them directly. You can ask them through these different features that we have available to you. Um, it's all about learning together. So as we get started, please feel free. Just ask us what's on your mind. We've got lots of experts on this call and we'll do our best to get to your answers today, if not today in the follow-up communication. So I'm excited to turn the floor over to my colleague, Dane Shelton. 
who will present an overview of this amazing screenshot of our Florida FAFSA Challenge dashboard and what it tells us about how we did this summer of 2024. Thank you, Dane. The floor is yours. Thanks, Kim. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, everyone, for being here, and congrats on the tremendous effort to increase FAFSA completion over the doldrums of the summer months. Before getting into the numbers, I'd like to add the context that this year, we had about 8,000 more seniors enrolled in the state. That's going to be important to note when we consider the rates. All of the following values are coming from FCAN's FAFSA dashboard, which you can see on your screen right now. It's going to be linked in the slides as well. The period that we're going to be evaluating is between May 24th to August 30th. So let's go to the next slide and jump in. In a challenging FAFSA year, Florida has made remarkable progress in FAFSA completions over the summer. From May 24th to August 30th, we've added about 26,500 completions to our tally. That's compared to 20,800 in the previous year's cycle. Considering the completion counts of the defined start and end dates in both cycles, we saw a 40% increase this year, as opposed to a 26% increase in the previous cycle. Our week-to-week -week growth in the summer was also stronger, as the count of completions increased by about 2.4% each week, in contrast to 1.6% during the same period over last year's cycle. Next slide, please. So over here, we're taking a look at rate. Right, And this value is going to be completions over total seniors. So this year, we saw a 12 percentage point increase during the summer months, again, edging last year's 10 percentage point increase. With 8,000 more seniors enrolled this year, we jumped from a 31.1% completion rate in May to a 43.5% completion rate at the end of August. And we'll go to the next slide. Perfect. And finally, visualizing the gap between the two cycles that we just discussed, we've closed it by about two percentage points over these 14 weeks. This represents almost 5,000 completions towards breaking even or attaining the same completion rate as the previous year. Again, these values are taken from FCAN's FAFSA dashboard, and we'll be releasing a more detailed roundup of FAFSA activity over this period in the next edition of our newsletter. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me in the chat or on the email, I believe it's in the slides. Um, and I appreciate your time. Thanks, Kim. Awesome, Dane. So if we were in person, I would expect everyone to give a round of applause right now because that's really amazing numbers. And as Dane uh, pointed out, plus 8,000 more seniors enrolled this year. And still to see those percentage point shifts is remarkable over a really difficult summer. So. We're gonna learn from the people who led these efforts um, directly how they did this. Um, and I hope that you're taking away already that the there's a lot of students behind these numbers and there's a lot of adults supporting those students and, and peers and near peers. And this really represents thousands of Florida students who are now better positioned to pursue their educational dreams thanks to the collective efforts of all of us. So now we're going to hear from them, these seven incredible organizational leaders who have been on the front lines of FAFSA completion efforts since May and have not stopped, even though technically the summer is over, um, they're, they're continuing. So we're going to go around our state and each of these amazing organizations are going to share on the right are their most effective strategy, a key challenge they overcame, a surprising insight or and or something they plan to continue in the next FAFSA cycle. Um, they're gonna tell us some stories and these stories are at the heart of those numbers Dane just shared. Um, and I'm gonna start on the Gulf Coast with uh, Patrick Simon with the Citrus County Coalition mm -hmm. for College and Careers. Patrick is gonna kick us off. And then the way that this will work is that we're gonna to bounce to the next community organization and you're gonna introduce yourself um, and we'll just go around our state. So uh, Patrick, just to remind you all, right after you is going to be Crystal Maldonado with Future Makers. And if anyone else needs a reminder on who goes after that, I'm happy to remind you. Um, but so Patrick, thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you. And again, my first, uh, gratitude goes to FCAN in general, because I don't believe we would exist 
we started six years ago and nothing of what we had done six years ago is what we're doing now. And that's a result positively from the impact of teams across the state that have helped us. So my, my first set of thanks is to the FCAN team, an enlightening and empowering group. The project we did this summer, and again, we're a team of volunteers that, that have a, a tight connection with the school district and our state college. We go into the schools every single week, every single high school, there are three in our school district, every week of the school year. So, and we meet with students every week. Uh, example, last year, we met with over 650 students of the 1,000 students in Cit Citrus County Schools. Uh, and that, again, doesn't reflect the multiple meetings. So we have documentation of over 3,500 meetings of one-on-one -on -one with student and volunteers to assist in enrollment in post-secondary programs. FAFSA was a challenge for us, lots of frustration. But what we discovered was in, in the midst of working on FAFSA during the January, February, March, that students were so resourceful in working through some of the issues on the platform and trying to submit FAFSA. So, and that's what triggered their idea of, let's look at help, having students help us at the end of the year in trying to increase some of the loss that we experienced because of, of problems with the application. So we ended up with a grant that had four students. They were paid $25 an hour with a plan for a bonus based on the number of students that they could assist in, in submitted applications. And so those students received, with the help of the school district, information of every student in their high school. So the four students were linked to three high schools, two from the largest high school, and they contacted using the Office of Student Financial Assistance FAFSA information that had the student listed. The district provided them with email, phone number, contact information, parent information. So these students contacted every one of their classmates. Our schools average in size about 350 students. So whether or not they completed FAFSA or not, they called every student. They let the students and family know if they finished the FAFSA, uh, congratulations. If they didn't, they assisted and said, if, if uh, you did not start a FAFSA, I am here to help you. This is where I can meet you. Or these are locations, whether it be a Starbucks or, or any other coffee shop in town, restaurant, quick food restaurant. And for the students who had errors incomplete, they said that they could assist to help them. So the results, I will tell you, they have a powerful voice, far more effective. And I think that was our, um, that probably that was one of the challenges was how do you reach to these students and families? They could leave a message and every student would call them back a family. So I often say that, you know, we refer to six degrees of separation. I think our students have a percentile degree of separation. So less than one. Uh, our key challenge, again, besides students or parents not following up or responding, I will say we found that our, our student FASPA coaches were far more effective in getting them to meet and work through and resolve. So in the end, what happened? These students completed close to 200 FASPA applications in six weeks, which really is 42% of the total FASPA submitted in the school district. We think that is amazing, and we have exceeded the previous year's FAFSA applications according to our records of the enrollment of students in our school district. Uh, surprising outcome. I am stunned by how smart, how quick, how efficient, how technology-wise, how, how they were able to, on their own, contact FAFSA, have conversations. I witnessed them having conversations with the FAFSA help desk agent and helping the student. Uh, and so much so, and this is item four, what will it lead us to? So right now what we're planning to do is we are now, we now will have five FAFSA coaches uh, in each school. And those coaches will be assisting. First of all, some of those coaches will be helping our grant, our innovative innovation grant, where they will address the most at-risk students. But we also have, what we're calling our FAFSA envoys. They will be helping all students in the school with FAFSA. They come in and help us when our volunteers are there after school day. Some of those students are dual enrolled. 
Though, and every student that serves as a FAFSA envoy or FAFSA coach receives a scholarship from us. Uh, that scholarship is $1,500 for the year. The students who are our innovation coaches uh, that are helping the, a teacher or staff member who's a coach as well, they're receiving $2,500 scholarship. So that's how we're discovering that the impact, they do a far better job than we do. Wonderful. Wow. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you for going first as well. That was sort of intentional because Citrus County is the most improved county in Florida in FAFSA completions. And you just heard why. So bravo. Let's keep the momentum going. Crystal, I know you're up for the challenge. Tell us what Future Makers was up to this summer. Yes. Hi, Kim Kimberly. Um, thank you everyone for um, having me. So for um, us future makers, we um, serve five counties. So we're serving Collier, Charlotte, Lee, Henry, and Glades. So it's, um, and it's very spread out. So our challenge, um, so I'll talk about a little bit of what we did. So we wanted to be able to offer a menu of different options for our students, for our families. Uh, so we had a lot of in-person events. And, and like you mentioned, Kim, we are still having a lot of in-person events, um, even now. So we, if we are having in-person events, we also um, provided uh, FAFSA virtual drop-ins. And for the in-person events, we want needed to be very versatile. So we want we offered daytime events, evening, and also Saturday events. And then we also have a FAFSA first email address. So when there are any questions, uh, our team has access to that and we're able to respond quickly uh, to those questions and provide assistance. Uh, we What we did is to market all this information and all these resources, we created a flyer that provided all the in-person dates, the times, locations. And again, we wanted to be able to bring these um, in-person assistance to folks in the different counties. So we partnered with our uh, nonprofit um, partners that work with students, as well as our post-secondary partners, because especially our state college is spread out across the different counties. So we were able to offer help there and assistance. So it was definitely the most effective was working with those partners. Um, some of the challenges are because we don't have student lists. We don't serve the students directly. Uh, sc the schools were closed over the summer. So it's very challenging to be able to um, get in contact with students, with parents, so we had to really depend on those partnerships and collaborating with those um, organizations to be able to reach the students. So um, they also created their own version of the flyers to be able to share out to the students for their individual events. And that really did help get um, attendance and participation. And um, also what we realized um, when schools opened back up, some of the counselors mentioned that over the summer, they had a lot of their class of 2024 students reaching out for assistance. And unfortunately, you know, with schools being closed, they weren't able to really assist the students. So when we were able to get back into the schools, we were able to um, have some in-person events at the local high schools, a few of them so far, that we invited the class of 2024 to come back. So class of 2024 to come back. And um, another addition of positive is that some of the class of 2025, the our current seniors, also showed up with their parents and we were able to get them um, started as well with creating their FSA IDs in preparation for the FAFSA that's opening up. So it kind of had that, that dual purpose. And, you know, we do want to continue that because we have students that, you know, feel probably forgotten and we want to keep including them throughout the year for any future events that we'll be hosting. And um, we also planned, um, are planning to keep the Saturday events, maybe not every you know Saturday but kind of sprinkle some of those Saturday events because that was one thing that was surprising we had moved away from Saturday events over the past few years and really focusing and honing in on the in high school events and so what we are uh, what we saw is we had a high attendance on the Saturday events from parents that were able to be there with the students as well as um, the students there receiving help. So we do want to continue uh, this kind of menu of opportunities and options to help our families in the communities. For the virtual um, drop-ins, we did realize that um, by creating um, by appointment virtual assistance, 
will be will work better for us so that we are able to serve the student and give them their allotted time and also so that we know um, when someone will be there so we don't we're not waiting around either for you know maybe no one to show up so we're definitely by appointment virtual assistance that we'll be offering um, still keep the virtual um, I mean the in-person assistance but really working with partnering with those nonprofits that we're working with, with those post-secondary partners to be able to bring some of the services to the students. The schools will still be offering um, in-person assistance, but we really um, need to work with our partners a little bit more. And that's something that we did see high attendance from students because of that partnership. And um, I'm going to put in the drop-in a link and all it is, it's just a few photos of some of the events that we hosted over the summer, um, as well as what we did is we had a certificate made. So when the student was able to submit their FAFSA, we celebrated them with you know this photo and sharing the information and um, highlighting them so that they you know had that recognition as well, and you know encourage other students to be able to um, move forward with it, getting that FAFSA. We also um, included in that flyer that messaging of it's not too late to complete the FAFSA. You know, a lot of students still felt that, you know, it's too late for me to go to school. And we kept putting that message, even if you didn't get in for fall, we can still help you for spring. Um, you know, you can keep going. So we definitely shared that message um, in any of the communications that we were um, posting and sending out as well. And so that is it definitely gonna continue the services um, that we did over the summer, but maybe a little, um, you know, more and more, um, you know, impactful, hopefully. Thank you, Crystal. I hope you all felt how much all of that work is truly making a difference. Um, thank you. We're going to go to your neighboring region and hit up our two organizations from Miami-Dade. Uh, Tyler, you're going to kick us off and our two Miami-Dade presenters both have slides. So you're going to share and then stop share and then kind of pass the mantle to Erin once you're finished. So welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Kimberly. Um, and hello, everyone. My name is Tyler O'Neill. I'm coming from Graduate Miami-Dade. Um, we are the local college access network here in Miami-Dade. And I just made a few slides uh, just to give a brief um, overview of what we did and, and to really address all those spaces that were put up. So what we did in Miami is we provided training workshops to a variety of providers. So these were train the trainer workshops where we knew um, it was important before we even touch the kids that um, there are so many adults that have touch points with kids across the county, and it may be even more effective in addition to helping families and youth, but also educating and training these people that are going to be helping these uh, people out with the FAFSA. And so we did a train the trainer workshop with a list of community-based organizations, um, which was very successful. It was led by um, Florida International University. And then because the local United Way, um, we are the backbone um, and we have a, a, a large network of partners, um, we also reached out to our local banks and we did uh, partnerships with our local um, trainings with our local banks um, on how to assist families with the FAFSA. And um, now these banks, they are holding office hours at the beginning of their banking hours to families um, that can come in. And what's great about this is that it's private and um, and they're bankers, right? So they, they have a, a stake in this as well. They, they also want their clients to be financially stable. The next thing we did was we incentivized accountability. Um, and so, so after the training, we wanted to um, make sure these train um, these folks they were being incentivized. So, for every ten um, FAFSA applications that were completed and submitted, we would give them a two hundred um, dollar um, incentive. Um, and so, we wanted to make sure um, that we kept the energy up for them and and the drive for them. Obviously, they they want to be in this work. Work, but we wanted to make sure we reward them because it's, it's really hard to, to, to do this work. The next thing we did is we incentivized the youth um, that completed and submitted the FAFSA. We provided $20 Amazon gift cards. And if the youth um, referred any other youth, um, we would give them $10 per referral. 
And then last but least, um, just as I mentioned, as United Way um, Miami being the backbone, we really try to leverage our community partner reach. And so with this, um, we were able to approximately reach 130,000 residents just um, just on the awareness by itself that FAFSA was important. Um, and, and that really helped us out. And if, if I'm being honest, that really pulled some people out of the weeds that we didn't know that also had a stake in this. And they popped up and they said, hey, we're working on this too. How can we work together? Um, and so this next slide, this right here, um, this is just some of the organizations that worked with us through um, this summer, whether they helped us prepare, whether they um, participated and they came to a training session and they did their own sessions themselves at their own organization. And I just wanted to take a moment just to show um, just to really highlight these folks here because they really went out of their way. And actually, I have um, Education for All, who I know they're going next. I had to make sure I highlighted them because I actually met them through um, these convenings with FCAN. So I really appreciate FCAN. And um, it, it actually was a blessing to meet them because they were actually able, I heard, um, to connect with a few other community partners. So that was great. And so what did we learn? So something that I did, I know uh, we had effective strategies first, but I wanted to start with key challenges because um, being in Miami-Dade, um, and we are the third largest school district in the nation, uh, we have some unique challenges um, down, um, down here in our county. So the first is um, undocumented families. Um, so we already know um, the FAFSA glitch, everything that was happening by itself, that was already a challenge. Um, but when um, we had undocumented families that didn't have a social security number, they didn't have an ID, um, they couldn't get past a, a certain threshold that really discouraged a lot of families um, to, um, to not finish or they didn't know what to do next. Like, what do I do? And so we knew um, going into this that we needed to have the supplies and, and the language. And when I say language, I mean multiple languages. So English, Spanish, Creole, Portuguese, whatever you may have in order to support these families. The next thing um, that we, we saw a challenge with is, um, and I'm pretty sure everyone else saw it, but there, there's conflicting priorities of the incoming freshman class. So um, when we were working through this, we worked with both Miami-Dade College and um, Florida International University. And when we were offering our workshops, um, I'll give an example. Miami-Dade uh, College, they anticipated about, at the moment, it was a little over 8,000 incoming freshmen that had not completed their FAFSA. And so when we were working with them um, to push this out to all of them, and so when I tell you we're sending it out through text messages, emails, phone calls, right? Um, when it came down to it, um, it was really tough to engage them. Um, and um, on the opposite side, where they knew that they had more time, um, there was a lot of mistrust of the system. Um, there were some people that were ashamed that they waited so long that they were just kind of hesitant to start um, in. And there were just some where it's just their priorities. It just wasn't their first priority. And they probably just really didn't have the true education of how FAFSA could um, change their education journey. And then our last uh, key challenge, which was a huge one. Um, so our local school district, so NDCPS, um, they don't have any access to data or contact information once the seniors have graduated. And we knew this going into the summer, right? So we knew going into the summer that any touch point on reaching out, we couldn't rely on our local school district. Um, however, our local school district, they did everything they could around that to, to be able to support us. So what was our most um, effective strategies? So Tyler, I'm so sorry. I, okay. This is so good. I feel like we could have a whole webinar on you, but we've got to go to Eric because- we've Okay, so I'll stop. So, so here goes the rest of this here. Um, <laughs> I appreciate the time. Thank you Thank so you. much to everyone. Um, and, and we, we um, leave this up for a second and then he can pull up his slides and then we'll make sure that we share this out because that was really good. All right, Tyler, thank you again for having me at that train, the trainers workshop. It was actually a lot of fun to help other people that are going to be helping other people. Um, and honestly, like everyone has done before. Uh, thank you again, Kimberly and the FCAN team for having us here. Thank you to all the other organizations that have been doing this work. 
for some quick context, I am Eric Marroquin. I am the program director at Educación for All. And we primarily work with first generation families in South Florida, meaning that a majority of the families we work with have Spanish speaking parents with English speaking students. Like some of our colleagues here have mentioned, the biggest challenge we faced was that when it's summertime, school is off the mind for the vast majority of families. While we received plenty of registrations for events, we would often see that only a handful of them would actually attend. So our approach became to meet students and their families where they're at. We figured that even if we helped just one person at each, work at each workshop, it would be one person more that has access to an opportunity that can change their life. We started a month later than all the other organizations. Uh, so over the course of the summer, we've hosted 24 workshops, splitting them almost evenly between online and in-person events, primarily using the public library as a free place to gather people. We also had free hour-long sessions with students and their families online, which they could schedule via our website. And I'm happy to report that our efforts allowed us to surpass our original goal of helping over 200 families submit their FAFSA this year. Now, as for the most surprising insight that we encountered was the number of multi-generation student households that we have here in South Florida, meaning that parents were going back to school at around the same time that their high school student graduate child would be attending. So fortunately, this meant that we were able to inform parents that they too were eligible to apply for FAFSA. Um, luckily, we were equipped to handle both dependent and independent students uh, for the FAFSA applications. Uh, I know a lot of the focus among the other organizations has been to focus on freshman students, the class of 2024 that just graduated. Uh, but we are very happy to see that we could help the entire family uh, through the FAFSA process. So for the next FAFSA, we're armed with the knowledge of a ton more very specific edge cases. And like Tyler mentioned earlier, South Florida, it's a lot of different communities that have uh, found themselves here. It's a huge melting pot. There's a lot of different circumstances, people, come, people coming from all over the place. Um, but we're armed with that now. Uh, we have solutions to technical glitches, so I, could, I highly doubt next year is going to be worse than this year. And we'll continue to keep meeting students and their families where they're at and helping them as is. And that's it. Thank you again. Thank you so much. I love how you brought in some of those messages from our summer learning community about um, not feeling bad if your event is only serving one student. That's one student whose life you're changing. So thank you for bringing that back to this call. And thank you, Tyler and Eric. Um, again, we could have had a whole separate session on each of your efforts. So I apologize for interrupting. Um, we're going to swing back up the Gulf Coast, and we're going to hear from Dr. Jerrica Peets with Leap Tampa Bay, and then we're going to go to Planet Sarasota, um, Lordana, and then ending with Education Equalizers in Alachua County. Just a little reminder, who's next? Thank you. Um, I want to knock on wood because he said we might, it might not be worse. <laughs> so, um, what we did uh, for Leap Tampa Bay, we served two kind, two counties, Pinellas and Tampa Bay. Both are very large counties. There are 17 schools in Pinellas and there's 27 in Tampa Bay. So there are a lot of students that we're trying to reach um, to complete their FAFSA. Um, and one of the things that we felt was the most effective uh, strategy for us was to utilize our partners. So we worked directly with our university and college partners, as well as our school district to make sure we can reach the students that we were trying to reach who are those graduates of 2024. So we did two separate in-person events and we made them like FAFSA fairs. So it wasn't just come complete your FAFSA, it was we're gonna have a DJ, we're gonna have food, we had face painting, we had balloon twisting, we had all kinds of things. So we wanted to make it a family event so that if parents had younger children and they needed somewhere for those children to go while they were filling out their FAFSA, they can bring them to this event. Um, I wish I had pictures because there was great face painting that happened for those younger students. Um, so one of the key challenges that we overcome was the fact that it was an all-inclusive family event. And I think that really helped us increase the amount of families that came out. Um, our events were on Saturday, so I agree with having the Saturday event 
Um, and one of the surprising insights of those Saturday events is that most families come early. So we found that if our event started at nine, the doors were busting, being bust down at nine. Um, and then it dwindled down afterwards. So that was a really surprising insight is that it seems like having those events earlier in the day works better for a lot of our families. Um, one of the things that we would keep doing for the next FAFSA cycle is we kind of want to have a FSA ID event before our FAFSA event. Because what we found was a lot of people would come to our FAFSA event not having a FAFSA ID, a FSA ID, and so then they couldn't complete the FAFSA. So we were happy to get them started, but then it was like we would need another event for those families to come back to where they can actually sit down with our financial aid experts and do their FAFSA. So that's definitely something we would do moving forward is have that FAFSA ID, uh, FSA ID event so that we can make sure that when they come to the FAFSA event that they can complete their FAFSA. Another thing that we will make sure is to have it as family friendly as possible. So the face painting was a hit. The food was definitely a hit. The DJ was a hit. Um, so everybody just really had a good time on a Saturday. And I felt like that was an effective strategy that we were able to utilize for our families on those Saturdays. Um, and I think that was a little bit better than the afternoon, after school, after work event. So moving forward, we will probably encourage our partners to have more Saturday family fun day events. And so... That's what we did in Tampa Bay. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, I, I want to see some of those pictures too. But um, as we as you were talking, I, it occurred to me, Tyler, I saw your awesome response to that Q&A. And if any other panelist wants to chime in on the questions, you just go to the answered tab and then you can add answers to what one of your colleagues might have said. Um, so thank you. And please keep the questions coming. I know we're going rapid fire around our state, uh, but if you want to ask anyone anything, this is really, you, you'll you have the floor panel, our Q&A uh, participants. So Lordana, uh, Planet Sarasota. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Lordana Guillaume and I am the program coordinator for Planet Sarasota. Our, here we go. So we would say our most effective summer strategy, I'd like to quote our program director. He's known for his quotables, uh, Thomas Williams. He always says that we move at the speed of relationships. And often that is in reference to us building new partners to join our LCAN. But in this instance, after having found out about the grant and having to move at rapid pace, what came in handy were our strongest relationships. And we are a strong but mighty team of two. So we would be nowhere without our local state college, the State College of Florida. Uh, so our financial aid department, they really we're willing to be as compromising as possible. And it really helped us to not have to kind of scramble through having to train the trainer uh, because they're a very well-oiled machine. Uh, so we're really, really appreciative to them. In addition to the State College of Florida, some of our strongest community organizations were willing to kind of hop and do whatever they needed to do. In addition to the school district and within our school district, approximately seven high schools uh, some of the high schools, as often as they were willing to re-offer sessions, both FSA ID and the full FAFSA, they were willing to help us. And this was doubly appreciative because while we had strong relationships with those organizations, those individuals have strong relationships with the students. Uh, so it helps to build in that accountability. One of our key challenges was um, attendance. So we offered as many events as we could, over 25. Uh, we offered them at a variety of locations, variety of times, but oftentimes, like some other um, people mentioned, maybe we would have a attendance number of two or three. Uh, so our solutions in that were two main things uh, with the example of the State College of Florida and their trusted individuals there. I would often, during an admissions week, leave a number of gift cards for the students and information to write down and tell them, hey, if someone drops in and they qualify under the requirements, please feel free to do so on our behalf and now pop in and take in the information. So they were essentially um, additional staff 
in addition, if we in, encountered a student who wanted to come or very often came to the event, we were unable to help them. I would actively kind of have my boots on the ground across the county, meet them wherever they needed to, a library, virtual, one-on-one uh, -on -one in our office, and see if we can have a, a SF ambassador as well come in and help support us. Uh, so we were really tackling the every number counts. One surprising insight that we noticed were the amount of common issues that we had. We had a lot of students that came in because their issue was tied to the signature page. And what we took that as a uh, indicator of our uh, how strong our efforts were in the beginning of the FAFSA rollout. But we were, of course, just mired by the inability to complete the applications all the way through. So it was a, a double sense of reward and relief when we were able to reset the application, restart the application, and have them complete it all the way through um, and give family that sense of relief uh, because we were dealing with families that were revved up and ready but felt like that one big barrier was preventing their students from being able to see their way out to college. And in the next cycle, we want to continue to combine our methods of offering FSA ID nights and follow-up FAFSA nights with more experimental methods of uh, being able to reach out to community organizations at times where they're already hosting students, um, offering our available sessions one-on-one, -on -one, virtual drop-ins, library drop-ins, so meeting students where we are. And that's about it. Thank you. You're so humble. Yes, that's it. Um, just a little <laughs> bit of 20 something. How many? 28? Yes, 28. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much, Lordana. You're welcome. Last but definitely not least, least Dr. Karji Scott with Education Equalizers. Um, Warn her she was going to close us out. She's up for the challenge. Amazing. Thank you so much, Dr. Krupa and the entire AFCAN team for arranging this opportunity for us to highlight our efforts on FAFSA completion. So my name is Karji Scott and I founded the Education Equalizer Foundation. We are a small but mighty volunteer team. And over the summer, we hosted 15 FAFSA events, some in person, some virtual. We partnered with local libraries, so the Alachua County Libraries. We also partnered with the Education Foundation, um, local summer school programs, Santa Fe College as well. And we shared our information about how to complete the FAFSA via a landing page at educationequalizers.org forward slash FAFSA. And on that landing page, it actually gave individuals the steps to complete the FAFSA independently in case they weren't able to meet with us uh, in person or virtually. And it allowed families to schedule one-on-one -on -one appointments with our FAFSA coaches. Um, and one of our FAFSA coaches um, was able to also help our Spanish speakers. So we did reach uh, via email, text and mailer um, over 1600 Alachua County high school seniors. And this was because our um, partners at Alachua County schools were gracious enough to provide their contact information. And we also sent a direct mail piece to over 1700 families in Lake County. Um, and so we noticed that they attended some of our events as well. And they are still attending events um, as a result of our FAFSA efforts. Um, our FAFSA website received over 700 views. We also had a number of social media posts on Instagram and LinkedIn and Facebook regarding FAFSA that garnered over 900 views. Um, a key challenge that we overcame was we just wanted to make sure that we offered the services to everyone everyone. Um, and so we did notice that we had some um, Spanish speakers who wanted to get information. So we made sure that we offered someone with um, trained knowledge to assist them. And we actually also had a student that didn't have a computer at home. And so she scheduled an appointment with us virtually on her phone, but then met us in person. So we made sure to meet students where they were, um, like the other panelists had, had mentioned. 
Um, and then another challenge was just making sure that any misinformation about the FAFSA uh, was 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 educated, was was taught to families, um, because sometimes parents had questions about, well, I'm high income or I'm low income, and what's going to be the outcome of completing the form? Is this going to be a waste of my time? So we wanted to ensure that families knew that this is definitely valuable, uh, a valuable way to spend your time. And so we're really grateful to Bill Goodman of the Education Foundation, who also really stepped in to help us to overcome those obstacles and those myths uh, related to completing the FAFSA form. Um, a surprising insight that we were able to um, have or outcome was that students in both Alachua and Lake Counties decided to register for other programs with us, um, and they're still viewing our FAFSA landing page. And so we plan on after this, because I, I wanted to make sure it stays static for now so that you could see exactly what it looked like when we were using it for the summer. Um, we are planning to continue adding more FAFSA materials from different partners, you know, Department of Education, AFCAN, NACAC, and others, um, so that people can continue getting the help that they need individually in one centralized place, but they have the benefit of scheduling one-on-one -on -one appointments with our FAFSA coaches if they need more assistance. So we're grateful for that. And so a thing that we will continue to do for the next FAFSA cycle is exactly that, just continuing to keep that landing page updated. We want to also um, adopt a high school in Alachua and Lake County so that we can beta test the FAFSA with them and then help them with the actual FAFSA. And uh, the question that families had, and I think this is just a natural question is, you know, what other scholarships are available outside of the FAFSA? Um, and so we've also begun to partner with organizations that help educate families about scholarship opportunities that they can earn um, here locally, um, and maybe even further away um, for different schools and universities and such. So thank you again for this opportunity. Thank you so much. Um, during our summer on our learning call, I know everyone was crushing on you for being able to get the information from your graduating seniors from your school district. Can you just add a little bit about how you were able to do that? So I'm really grateful um, that our local school district was willing to partner with us. You know, we just reached out to them and said, hey, you know, we're the new baby organization on the block and let us show you what we can do when you invest in us. And we are like, the only investment we need is your students and allowing us to service them. And so as a result of that, um, we are partnering with uh, our local school system to host even more events uh, coming up soon. So they just answered the call. You make it sound so simple. Um, <laughs> wonderful. So I do have a couple questions um, for, for all of you, and we'll just see what we can get through. Um, whoever wants to jump in and answer this first question, and then if we feel like we exhaust that, we can get to the second question. But the first question for our panelists is, how has your experience with summer FAFSA completion changed your organization's overall approach to college access and success? We heard a little bit about that already, but maybe like recenter that uh, on your experience. And then any unexpected benefits or insights for you that extend beyond FAFSA completion? If I can jump in on that one. So, oh, I'm sorry? Yes. Uh, in Citrus County, our state college is the College of Central Florida. Uh, we convinced them to join us every week at every high school as we assist students. So they send their trio representative who's there. Their enrollment increased 36% this year at the branch in Citrus County. That, my, I guess my understanding of 36% is an enormous number of enrollment increase and when 2% is considered significant. So, and I think that part of that is, and I say that to all of us, we discovered that when students see the impact and the amount of money available to them in a FAFSA award, they are encouraged and can truly believe that I can go to college. I have the resources, the funds I need that are not going to cause me stress or the need to work multiple jobs. And I think that leads to not only them enrolling and or, or avoiding summer melt, but, but to stay and persist 
beyond that first year. So again, I think that's an unintended outcome as well. You were reminding me, Patrick, of that statistic um, that a lot of us use um, from the National Education Center that NCAN also uses, which is 90% of students who complete the FAFSA go on to pursue a post-secondary education and persist, compared to about half of their peers who don't. And so it sounds like you're really seeing the, the students behind that statistic in your work. Anyone else want to jump in on that first question? Um, you've sort of all touched on it, Dr. Scott, with the scholarships and, and that connection. Also, Crystal, the layered approach that you're bringing to the work, FAFSA plus, not just FAFSA, but everything else that cascades from it. Um, yes. Well, something else. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say something else I wanted to um, touch on is, you know, we focused a lot and, you know, on that class of 2024 with those efforts, but also as um, the schools open and, you know, looking at how can we provide access to all student types, we do have a number of adult students in our area. And so something that when I mentioned, you know, we want to do more partnerships um, within our community that also extends to our adult education. So we're working on having a few assistance sessions with our adult education uh, with our school districts and hopefully expand that even further and offer throughout the year. Uh, because we, there are definitely a lot of student um, types that we, um, you know, haven't focused on as much over the over time, and we want to be able to assist those students too. And I mean, even another student group that, um, you know, the homeschooled students, you know, being able to provide those services and opportunities. And something we do see as well is a lot of students asking about scholarships and how do we get that information out to them. And some of our efforts that we've done is um, when school is in session and we'll continue to do is we help with the FAFSA, but also the Florida financial aid application, any of our local scholarships um, that are available to students so they can maximize their um, financial aid opportunities. Wonderful. Did you want to jump in? Crystal read my mind. <laughs> awesome. For the second question, just for the sake of time, if someone just wants to unmute and shout out, what would be their bold or innovative dream come true idea? If resources were unlimited and we lived in heaven, what would be your thing? If we made it um, mandatory, that's that's mine. If we made it mandatory, if, yes. If, uh, some other states have already implemented some variation of uh, mandatory FAFSA completion uh, as, a, uh, I believe, either a graduation requirement or enrollment requirement for the universities. Uh, and when it's required to do it, you're like, well, if I have to do it anyways, uh, a lot of people would be getting those benefits. So that's mine. And I was going to say, we've been trying to elicit uh, influencers or content creators. And so if we can get some big influencers and content creators who went to college, experienced with the FAFSA, and we could afford to pay them some of their rates <laughs> to, to talk about FAFSA to their very large followers, that is what we would love to do. I, I would like to see employers promoted more um, because that's what, at the end of the day, that's what it's being led to. It would be nice to see um, employers um, that have some type of workforce development um, platform to say, hey, complete the FAFSA because one day you could work here, right? And even down to like employers that like you may not even expect. So I, I it would be nice to see that because I think that would be a game changer. For me, it would be, especially during the kickoff of, of FAFSA up until the end of the school year at each of our seven high schools, having a little FAFSA center for the evenings after work from between four to seven, that parents and their students can just wait until after school or pop by after work and be able to get that done and over with. But we would need, obviously, the staffing to be able to do that. But that would be a dream. Wonderful. Um, I'll go ahead and chime in too <laughs> with everyone's dreams. But um, for me, um, it was something that we're, it's in the works and we hope to have it. I mean, I don't know when with time, it'll take time, but, you know, providing that training, like you mentioned, train the trainer, 
We're providing that and it's available to anyone and everyone in schools, nonprofits that um, can receive that training, uh, feel comfortable with the FAFSA, feel comfortable, um, you know, working with the families and the students, because a lot of times it's it's scary for families. And then what, once they go through it, they're like, oh, that's it. I'm done. You know, I mean, this year a little, you know, definitely a little more complicated, but it'll get easier, um, we hope, with time. And I think it's just letting everyone know, you know, sometimes mistakes are made, but you can go back in and correct those mistakes and it's okay. So I think for me, it'd be ideally to create some kind of training uh, opportunity that's open to everyone that um, to be able to help students. And even um, something we le we're looking into is how could we make this a part of like that continuing education for educators so that they're also able to get credit for it and, you know, be able to help students. So for me, it'd be just something that provides as many resources and makes everyone comfortable with completing the FAFSA, as well as, you know, making it graduation requirement. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. That was incredible. Um, thank you all for jumping in, bringing us to your communities, walking us through your journey and sharing with us your dreams. Uh, really inspiring. Some practical dreams in there too. And we will do our best at the state level to, to push these onto a bigger stage. Um, I do want to share some breaking news from one of our partners um, in Broward, which we used a lot of Broward's YouTube uh, trainings for the summer from Dr. Daniel, Daniel Barkowitz. Um, but I just wanted to share that Broward has been selected as one of the six organizations nationally to, to be beta one testers for the 2025-26 FAFSA. Um, this is a testament to the innovative work happening in our state, B2L being one of our FAFSA summer uh, providers and has that awesome YouTube page. It's going to be a dinosaur soon, but a lot of us used it over the summer to get through some humps. Um, so I think it was today or yesterday that the USDOE announced details for the beta two to four cohorts. Um, and we'll provide that link to apply in the follow-up notes for the session, unless someone has the link readily available right now. But we definitely encourage all the community-based organizations working on FAFSA to keep an eye out for these opportunities. And congratulations, go B2L. Um, FCAN also was hard at work this summer. These are just some images for some, some billboards that we had in high traffic communities across the state, some social media cards. We hosted, of course, our weekly learning community calls, we did a lot of information organizing, trying to capture what everyone was doing across the state and create a landing page and just keep that fresh and updated, but really be, uh, bully pulpit for you all to get your message out to as many people as we can through some paid media um, and a comprehensive media campaign. Of course, we kept the FAFSA dashboard alive. Thank you, Dane. That was your baby for weeks and weeks, uh, longer than we ever have kept that FAFSA dashboard alive. And I hope that you all used it and found that um, helpful in addition to the NCAN FAFSA tracker. We have some additional information on our dashboard that a lot of communities find helpful um, week to week. Um, in the coming weeks, we'll release the recording and the slides from today, along with uh, any links that were shared, photos. It'll be a really comprehensive uh, blog that we'll write with all the key takeaways from the summer and the summer FAFSA challenge. Um, looking ahead, we're also excited to announce our next Talent Strong Florida Summit will be held uh, in Orlando again, a different hotel, the Hyatt Regency Grand Cypress, May 5th through 7th. That's a Monday to a Wednesday this time. Uh, please save the date for this important convening where we'll continue to build on the momentum that we've created. And I'm imagining another, maybe not summer FAFSA, but maybe 2024, but maybe summer FAFSA 2025 with some, some of the beautiful folks from this webinar. Finally, as Crystal said, there's still time. Um, we're gonna share out this video in the follow-up. Um, it's also on FCAN's YouTube uh, page, but we, we had quite a few commercials and radio ads in English and Spanish, and this is one of them. So I just took a clip uh, to just reiterate this message. There's still time for the 2024 FAFSA. Hello, spring admissions. And that this work is never one and done, but a continuous learning journey. So thank you all once again for your participation, your tireless efforts. Um, 
to ensure every Floridian has the opportunity to pursue an education beyond high school and together we're making Florida talent strong. Thank you all so much. Have a great rest of your day.